the half hour. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Vera Toltz, Professor of Russian Studies at the University of Manchester, and it is my great pleasure to chair the session at which Professor Maxim Schreier will read to us from his memoir, Leaving Russia, A Jewish Story. Professor Schreier is Professor of Russian, English and Jewish Studies at Boston College, and he has published uh, award-winning academic work on Russian uh, and Russian Jewish culture in the 19th and 20th century. And in addition to that, Maxim is also a writer in his own right, having published poetry and prose fiction in the Russian and English languages. And after the reading, we'll have a Q&A session at which you'll be able to ask Maxim questions. And so now, without further ado, Maxim, welcome to this conference and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Vera, for this kind introduction. I just wanna make sure that you can see the picture and hear and see me. Could you just say, Vera, that that is the case? I can see you, uh, but uh, I think Kathy will now share the screen so we can see your power. Very good. Um, no, I think, Maxine, I think you'll have to start it again. Oh, very ready. good. So let's start because uh, it probably disappeared. So just one minute. How is that? Yes, we are. Okay, I so the screen is there and I'm see. still here. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Sander and Kathy and Ian for mounting this wonderful event. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I'm going to start with very brief uh, introductory comments. And then indeed, as Vera indicated, I will read from Leaving Russia, a Jewish story. And uh, the first one is who are refuseniks. Uh, as you know, the term refusenik is an imperfect calc of the Russian atkaznik. Um, the root there is atkas, which means refusal, imperfect because in the process of translation or other calcation, the term acquires uh, uh, some connotations that are not there in the original. The refuseniks actually do not refuse. Uh, they are refused. They're actually refusees. If anything, uh, perhaps the only thing that they refused is the ticket to uh, Soviet paradise because refuseniks are Jews and their families who uh, petitioned the Soviet government to be allowed to um, emigrate and go to Israel. And uh, um, then the Soviet regime um, refuses their applications and they are disenfranchised and become part of uh, es essentially a ghetto community without walls. And uh, some remain waiting for many years, some actually uh, uh, as long as a couple of decades. That's the first point. The second, how many refuseniks are there? And this is actually, uh, you would think it's quite obvious. It's not. And it's not uh, uh, a question that we can still answer comfortably, which is why demographers still cite Mordecai Altura's classic study, which was published in 1988, which he based on the data from uh, the list that the Anti-Defamation League maintained in 1986. And uh, Altura concluded that that there were about 11,000 refuseniks, so over 3,000 refusenik households, and that the average duration of waiting was about nine years. Uh, without uh, spending too much uh, time on this, I invite you to eyeball the um, statistic on the Jewish population in the Soviet Union. You will see just by eyeballing these numbers that uh, after um, 1980, when um, immigration to the Soviet Union becomes virtually non-existent, the floodgates close, um, I think a higher number uh, should probably be considered. In my estimation, between in 1979-87, there were as many as 20,000 refuseniks in the USSR. And this is a huge community because refuseniks are omnipresent. Uh, they are not just in big cities, but in smaller cities. They're not just members of the intelligentsia and intellectuals. They are uh, also 
in all fields and branches of employment. And then when they are disenfranchised, they very much enter the ranks of uh, the menial works, uh, workers, the lower strata of the Soviet population. In other words, it's hard to imagine a Soviet territory without an awareness of the problem of Jewish immigration and of the Jewish refuseniks who openly challenged the regime, openly challenged the regime's own legitimacy. And lastly, what do Refusenik want? Of course, the Refusniks want out. They want to be allowed to leave. Uh, if you look at the protest signs that these uh, Refusniks carry at the famous protest outside the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Moscow in 1973, the slogans are very consistent. Let us go to Israel, visas to Israel instead of prisons. Which brings me to the last sort of general consideration, which I think bears uh, directly to the on the subject of today's uh, symposium and uh, the very uh, interesting topics uh, that uh, Ian and uh, uh, Susan raised in their presentations. If Usenics as dissidents or Usenics versus dissidents, consider the fact that of the eleven original members of the Moscow Helsinki group formed in 1976. Two were Jewish refusenik activists, Natan Sharansky and Vitaly Rubin, who was later replaced by Vladimir Slipak. Uh, but also considered that there are six Jews out of those 11. And lastly, that um, almost every single one was uh, either emigrated or was forced into exile abroad. I think this paints uh, a more subtle picture of that relationship. There is, of course, considerable overlap between what the refuseniks and the dissidents are pushing for, and yet the goals are fundamentally different. Refuseniks want out. They want to have nothing to do with the system. Dissidents fundamentally want to challenge it, to uh, change it. And so this question requires a lot more time, but I just want to put it out there for you to consider perhaps uh, in connection with something that I will share on the more personal level, which is, uh, and then the last thing I just want to show you, this is a very rare document which has survived in the archive of my parents, the writer and medical scientist, David Schreier Petrov and the translator, Emilia Schreier. This is, uh, as you can see, a little sheet of paper with typed uh, protest signs, some of which were later crossed out and rejected. And I translated some of them, um, freedom of emigration to all refuseniks. The new emigration law is a violation of human rights. This is very important. Auschwitz, Babi Yar, and refuseniks, a Jewish tragedy. Of course, the Jewish-centric component and the emigration-centric component prevails, but human rights concerns are certainly there in what refuseniks are inevitably challenging, challenging the Soviet system. Uh, to uh, to address, which all brings me to um, this uh, book of mine, Leaving Russia, a Jewish Story, which now exists in Russian and also in Italian, and I'm hoping for a German and French translation soon. But uh, what I'm going to read to you are three short passages, all of which uh, come from uh, the period when the persecution of my parents as refusing to activists intensifies, uh, 1985, 86, and early 87. And uh, of course, I appear, and it's very important to make this disclaimer, in these episodes primarily as an observer primarily as an observer. I was a child when the decision to emigrate was made, uh, and uh, I was 20 when we were finally allowed to leave. So those were formative years for me, but they were also years when my parents tried very hard to shield me from direct refusing activism. And one of the common threads of the passages I've chosen is precisely how Jewish refuseniks very often decide to sacrifice their careers, in some cases, very successful Soviet careers for Jews and non-party members, only because they want to get their children out. They want to have their children, uh, to have the freedom to express their Jewishness, only to find themselves ghettoized and persecuted. And how refusing activists try hard to shield their teenage children from activism, but it doesn't work, uh, of course, in many cases, as you can well imagine. And then a couple of other common threads uh, in what I will read. One of them is, of course, the question of solidarity. 
the solidarity and the silence of uh, the Soviet majority. Of course, as you know, as you know, despite the great public awareness of the problem of Jewish immigration and the public problem of refuseniks, uh, refuseniks were shunned, and uh, there was very little private or public support on the part of the population. And that too is a thread here. And the last one that connects these three passages are refusenik protests. Basically refuseniks going out and, and openly challenging the regime at public protests and demonstrations. On some level, my parents had probably seen it coming. I recall a visit by two Canadians who traveled to the USSR in order to show their support for refuseniks. One of them, Michael Posner, was at the time a reporter for McLean's and now writes for the Toronto Globe and Mail. My mother, a customarily the spokesperson for the family, was telling Posner about the refusenik gatherings we hosted at our apartment and about the risks involved. By that time, our refusenik seminar salon had been going strong for a year. Also, the first part of my father's novel, Dr. Levitin, had found its way to the West. I remember coming home late from a party sometime in the autumn of 1984 to find my father and a photographer working in the bathroom on developing and hanging rolls of film to dry on the shower rod. In due course, the films were smuggled out of the country in a diplomatic pouch reaching the United States and then traveling to Israel, where my father's uncle, Munya Sharir, facilitated the novel's publication. By the autumn of 1985, the upcoming publication under the title, Being a Refusenik, was announced by Aliyah Library, a prominent publisher of Russian language books based in Israel. My parents knew they were being followed around, yet they spared me some of this knowledge. I wasn't told, but surmised, that my mother was struck in a crowded street by two men who under their breath threatened graver punishment if my parents wouldn't stop sticking out. Then in the last days of November, a subpoena summons was deposited in our mailbox, dated 27th November, 1985, and printed on the stationery of the Moscow city prosecutor, the subpoena requested Shrayer David Petrovich to appear on the 2nd of December, 1985 at 11 a.m. at the office of Prosecutor N.B. Tsirkunyenka. This slip of paper has survived among my parents' personal papers, and I'm looking at a photocopy of it as I type these lines, and you are looking at it on the screen as I read these lines. In the early evening of the day the subpoena arrived, Still trying to process the whole thing, my parents and I held a family conference. Various scenarios were considered and different options weighed from a public protest or hunger strike to ignoring the subpoena and buying time. My father called the latter the tactic of crushed glass. The situation was urgent and obviously dangerous. My parents and I decided to seek the immediate advice of seasoned friends and acquaintances from the refusenik and dissident circles. That evening, I went to see the Slipaks while my parents visited Valery Soifer. Soifer, formerly a successful Soviet geneticist, had substantial experience with dissident actions and many connections with Western scientists. My parents thought his counsel would be helpful. A former prisoner of Zion, Vladimir Valodya Slipak, was a legend within the refusenik and dissident movements and abroad. He and his wife, Maria, Masha, had been among the leading refusenik activists since the early 1970s. Refusenik spoke of his fearlessness and valor, of charging KGB thugs at demonstrations before they had a chance to strike him. I had heard from eyewitnesses of the day in June of 1978, when the Slipaks, along with another celebrated refusenik activist, Ida Nudel, flew banners with protest slogans from the balconies of their apartment buildings in Moscow. So this is the building and the banners were unfurled from these balconies down below. So Red Square is this way and the Pushkin Monument is that way. This is Moscow's main thoroughfare, uh, just so you we can uh, visualize this a little more. Um, they were arrested. Vladimir Slipak and Ida Nudel were sentenced to five years of forced exile, while Masha Slipak received a suspended sentence. My parents met and befriended the Slipaks by the time of Valodya's return to Moscow from Siberia. 
Valois de Slipak was in his late 50s when I got to know him, and the weighty silver curls of his hair and beard made him look like a cross between a biblical patriarch and a Judean zealot. Now retired from the kind of open activism for which he had paid with a prison sentence, Valois was still one of the Refusenik elders. Like a mighty bull, Having miraculously survived years of fighting, he would doze off during after supper conversations in our kitchen, looking imposing and strong also in slumber. The bespectacled round face of Masha Slipak carried a special dolorous beauty, sometimes given to aging Ashkenazi women. Even in her lightest moments, sadness never left Masha's face. Both of the Slipak's sons were living in the United States. Held hostage by the Soviet state and separated from her boys, the Slipak's Masha especially treated me with parental kindness. In Masha's big eyes, I read an unspoken reproach addressed to all Refusnik parents. The Slipaks were living right on Gorky Street in a communal apartment they shared with another family. My parents and I had last visited them just a week before the subpoena came on a Friday night. As Masha lit the candles, she whispered, eyes closed, please let me see my boys this year. She wouldn't see them for two more years until the autumn of 1987. After dinner, which was always accompanied by jovial drinking and the opening of the Slipak's bottomless trove of activist stories and prison camp anecdotes, my father, Valodya, and I stepped out onto the balcony for some air. So again, we're standing on uh, one of these balconies here uh, for some air. Down below, Gorky Street pulsated, Red Square on our right, the Pushkin Mon Monument on our left. The equestrian statue of the medieval Grand Prince Yuri Dolgaruki, often called the founder of Moscow, stood in a square below across the lanes of streaming traffic. My father and Slipak were talking about prospects of arrest and imprisonment. The earlier you go to jail, the earlier you'll get out, Slipak said, smiling relentlessly. My father didn't care for the comment, but said nothing. The pressures of being hunted by the Soviet secret police were mounting as November crawled into December, light days reaching their autumnal lowest limit. Cornered and gravely exhausted, my father ended up in the hospital with a heart attack. He was hospitalized at the fourth city where for several years he'd been serving as a consulting endocrinologist. The fourth city hospital had been founded by Emperor Paul I as a public hospital for the poor. In the early 1800s, the distinguished Russian architect Matvey Kazakov had revamped the main ward in neoclassical style, and thus the edifice stood unchanged for over two centuries, surrounded by a campus of newer buildings. The fourth city, formerly Paul's infirmary, was one of the city's better medical centers and a teaching and research hospital. Several attending physicians on the floor of the intensive cardiology unit knew my father from having previously done rounds with him, and he was receiving decent care. The first few days of my father's hospitalization were especially trying. I will rely on my father's words from the preface to his book, Vodka and Pastries. Of course, the KGB people knew my whereabouts. My attending told me they had insisted on conducting an interrogation directly in the intensive care unit. She replied, if you want his death, go and interrogate. They wanted my death, but by the hands of others. The plainclothes thugs left the ward, but they weren't prepared to leave my father alone. For the first several days, mother and I worried the most about nighttime when visitors, even family members, weren't admitted. The floor of the ward became deserted, save for a nurse on duty, and my father, lying on a hospital bed with an oxygen mask, was especially vulnerable. And uh, I'm going to stop uh, here, not the reading, you'll still hear a couple of short passages, but just to say that uh, eventually through a lot of, uh, uh, through a lot of action that uh, I described, uh, my father was temporarily left alone. And uh, I just want to, uh, um, I just want to share this one bit. This is an undated photo from this period. So the photo would eventually reach us from abroad. 
It has survived among my parents' papers, although we don't know who took it. Probably one of the foreign visitors who courageously, courageously came to the Soviet Union to support refuseniks. Um, and there were many, including, we've had over the years, Protestant ministers, uh, medical students from Montana, uh, many who were not Jewish and came out of solidarity, precisely the kind of solidarity we did not enjoy at home. Um, and uh, father, mother and I are photographed in the living room, which doubled as my father's den. To the left behind our backs is a China cabinet with white and blue Russian porcelain mugs out of which tea with lemon always tasted so good. To the right from where we're sitting is my father's desk with photos of the poet Alexander Bloch and of my grandfather Pyotr in wartime uniform. And this photograph is behind my back here now, by the way. Mm. On the edge of the coffee table in front of us is a plate of what looks like matzo meal cakes, a dish my mother often served to the foreign guests who kept kosher. I look serious, perhaps a little anxious, while my father and mother both have a stamp of exhaustion on their faces from fear of new troubles. For how much longer could they endure being refuseniks? Uh, and I'm gonna fast forward to the next uh, short passage, which uh, takes place uh, in the late winter of uh, 1987. So in the eyes of the world, this is already Pirestroke and Glasnost, but uh, what is often overlooked, uh, except by certain historians of uh, the Jewish emigration and of uh, the dissident movement is that of course, uh, early Gorbachev continues the crackdown on refusing activism. Um, here we go. Week-long dem refusing demonstrations had been scheduled to take place in the center of Moscow. Their goal was to protest the condition of Yosef Begun, but also to let the world know that refuseniks were still oppressed in spite of Pirestroik. Begun was a legendary Jewish activist, a Hebrew teacher, and one of the emblems of our movement. He was a prisoner of Zion serving a third sentence. His third trial took place in 1982 when refuseniks and dissidents alike were being terrorized into silence. In February 1987, Begun was 54, a few years older than my own father. He was being held at the infamous Chistopol prison in Tatarstan, where the dissident Anatoly Marchenka had died only two months, er two months earlier. Bigun was a refusing hero, and at home, we had frequently talked about his arrests, trials, and sentences. I remember hearing fragments of my parents' conversation about a refusing demonstration in support of Bigun. The initial intention had been just for women refuseniks, wives, mothers, sisters, and daughters to stand with Begun's wife and son in a busy Moscow street. To this day, I feel guilty about the way I said goodbye to my mother on the morning of the day she was going to stand at the demonstration for Begun's release. I sensed that my mother was planning to participate in a political action, but I didn't know for sure, and I didn't ask. I'm not sure my parents had ever told me. I'm not sure I knew. My memories of that February day are blurry, recollections of details blunted. Had I truly not known most of it, or have I suppressed the details? On that February day, my mother was beaten up by plainclothes agents at the demonstration. She was knocked off her feet and thrown on the pavement. I was not by her side. I didn't even stand in the sidelines supporting her. I was either in class or eating lunch at the university refectory or wherever else I was at the time, having a good time, flirting with a classmate, playing the normal Soviet student. When I came home that evening, my mother was lying in bed. Usually she is quick-witted and razor sharp in her reactions to the world. But that particular evening, there was unusual slowness to the way mother spoke and even to the way her smile spread out over her face, the way her hand floated up to touch my face as I bowed to kiss her. I have pieced together the story of that February day. It was on the Arbat, a sometimes hectic pedestrian area in the heart of old Moscow, a bit like Newbury Street in Boston. 
I knew practically every building and store on the Arbat. When I close my eyes, I can visualize the setting, the, st the stores, the window signs, but I don't see my mother. I wasn't there with her on the day of the demonstration. The main sources of how I picture my mother at the demonstration are a lone photograph and a short clip from a US news broadcast. And I'm not gonna show you the clip, but this is the photograph you're looking at in color that ran in Newsweek magazine. And it was taken, interestingly enough, by Andrew Rosenthal, who eventually became a very senior journalist at the New York Times, but at the time was a very junior AP reporter in Moscow. By the time the photograph appeared in Newsweek on the 23rd of February, 1987, just over a week after the Yosef Begun demonstrations, a brief news clip had already aired on ABC World News with Peter Jennings, reported from Moscow by Walter Rogers. Taken by Andrew Rosenthal, the photograph in Newsweek accompanied Mark Whitaker's article titled Countering Gorbachev, How Should the West Respond to Moscow's Glasnost Campaign? The caption under the photo reads, the limits of openness, begun sun, left, and other protesters just before attack. Cinematographers call this type of a medium long shot plan American. It's a knee shot of a group of three people standing in the street in winter clothes. On the left is Baris Bigun, to whom the Newsweek caption refers only as Bigun's son without a name. He's only two or three years my senior, but he looks much older. A thick, bristly beard covers his sunken cheeks. He wears a knit woolen sweater and an almost matching woolen cap with a pompon on top. His hooded coat is unbuttoned. In front of his chest, he holds a piece of brown cardboard with the words, freedom to my father, Yosef Bigun. To the right of Bigun's son stands my mother. She looks so beautiful in her man's muskrat fur hat and short fur jacket, beautiful and condemned. I can see her opaque lip gloss and shadows of rouge on her chalk white cheeks. Her eyes are looking inwardly as though she's facing imminent danger. Shades of determination, fear, calm, and irony are ensconced within her features. I look at the picture, I know this is my mother, and yet I cannot physically believe she's there in a small, defenseless formation of refuseniks. My mother is not identified in the Newsweek photo or in the news broadcast. The magazine caption describes her and the older refusenik gentleman standing next to her as other protesters. They are anonymous to history. The white hair of the old, older gentleman has come undone at his left temple. He's old enough to have fought the Nazis but it's not the Nazi enemies he's eyeing from under his heavy brow. My mother's gaze is turned upward and inward as though she refuses even to make eye contact with the thugs lined up in front of the demonstrators. But the older gentleman clearly sees something coming their way. To the right of the older refusing gentleman, I can make out a woman's fur hat of another demonstrator, but there are two more bodies There are two more bodies in the photograph. One is just an outline of what looks like a torso and hat, standing very close to the protesters. But the other one is much more tangible. In the right corner of the shot, facing the older gentleman and my mother, there is a man wearing a blue-gray striped hat with the Russian words, sports, sports, sports. One can only see his left cheek, jaw, and temple. And there is something disciplined, militaristic in his posture. The man's light brown barn jacket with a small fur, fur, fur collar and his sports, sports, sports hat were a Soviet everyman's clothes. They had no style or fashion. In them, one merged with the crowd, looked Sovietly nondescript. Some of the brutes who beat up my mother and the other refuseniks might have been not KGB operatives, but volunteers. Uh, I'm going to pause here just to point out again that this question of uh, Soviet citizens who volunteered to beat up refuseniks to disperse the demonstration, particularly to act violently toward Jewish refusenik women activists, is a very important one, and it is utterly obscured by 
post-Soviet historiography. I mean, if you look at Soviet textbooks, uh, if Refuseniks are mentioned, it's a blessing. But uh, this question is utterly and completely, completely silenced and obfuscated. And that brings me to the last short passage. Uh, and uh, this one is from March of 1987. Oh, by the way, I should point out one other thing that uh, Yosef Begun, I'm sorry, this is actually very important. Yosef Begun was released from uh, prison uh, several days after those demonstrations and returned to Moscow. And what I am showing here in the screen, again, is uh, I, think, uh, I think worthy of comparative reflection. On the left is the return of Andrei Sakharov from exile in Gorky to Moscow on the 23rd of December, 1986. And on the right is the return of Yosef Begun uh, to Moscow on the 24th of February, 1987. Uh, both events, uh, of course, were huge displays of the regime's change, but the latter was particularly important because, uh, because this was, at the time, probably the most prominent Jewish prisoner of Zion and activist, uh, and he was returned to Moscow. This was a celebration for the Refusenik community. Um, all right, and now the last passage. In late March, just as the 1987 Purim Spiel season had been winding down, the Refusniks had mulled over the news of a visit by Edgar Bronfman, then president of the World Jewish Congress, and Morris Abram, at the time president simultaneously of the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations and of the National Conference of Soviet Jewry. They were received in Moscow by high-level Soviet officials. We heard from various sources that on the table were the conditions of Soviet Jews, especially refuseniks, and emigration. The Jackson Vanek and the Stevenson Amendments, the former only repealed in 2012, restricted US trade relations with the Soviet Union. The linkage of Jewish immigration and the trade relations between the two countries was hardly new. New were concrete and real promises that Soviet officials had reportedly made. The Refusenik community was on the verge of change. Something had also changed in my parents attitude to my direct involvement in Refusenik politics. They weren't encouraging me, but they weren't trying to stop me either. A Komsomol membership no longer weighed me down or hindered me, nor was I any longer particularly concerned about being thrown out of the university. I finally felt free to protest the authorities alongside my parents and other Refuseniks. The demonstration I remember most vividly took place in early April in the center of Moscow. My father and I took the direct metro line to Pushkinskaya, then walked briskly for 10 minutes from the Pushkin Monument along the Tverskoy Boulevard toward the Nikitsky Gate. There was still a chill in the air, despite the late morning hour and the sun and the buds on the limes and poplars were only beginning to unfold and show green. The Grand Dame of Moscow's boulevards with its dark green benches, smaller monuments, and play areas with seesaws was empty, save for an occasional retiree reading a newspaper posted on a billboard or an old lady pushing a pram. We passed the Literary Institute on the right, the new building of the Moscow Art Theater on the left. Practically every inch of the street here was a museum of either public or private memories. In that mansion, Maria Yermolova, one of the greatest Russian actresses, once had her home. On that peeling bench, I had sat kissing a Jewish girl I had met in front of the Moscow synagogue, both of us recent high school graduates waiting to take university examinations. Tverskoy Boulevard was a legendary rendezvous terrain, and I was now treading it with my father on the way to a refusing protest. We approached the end of the boulevard with its public garden and circle of benches surrounding the monument to Kliment Timiryazev, eminent Russian botanist and plant physiologist. Past this point was a busy intersection where the boulevard ring veered to the right and continued for a few blocks under a different name only to hit the Arbat. From here, one could see the yellow 
confines and gilded cupolas of the Grand Ascension Church where Pushkin was married to Natalia Vincherova in 1831. More or less straight ahead lay Herzen Street, which took one past the Moscow Conservatory of Music and toward Red Square. Across the street on the left, the modern gray buildings of the Telegraph Agency of the Soviet Union, TASS, stood out among its teal and tea green old neighbors with ornate stucco facades. I was tempted to come out of the boulevard and turn right onto a quite lovely street called Malia Bronnaya with a struggling Russian, where, with a struggling Russian theater occupying the building that had once belonged to the Moscow Yiddish theater. A short stroll brought one to an enchanting area of Moscow, the patriarch ponds, and to what had once been an area of Moscow seething with Jewish life around the former synagogue at Balshaya Bronne Street. Timir Yazyev, Russian student of photosynthesis, stood tall on a granite pedestal, his hands crossed in front over his lap. lap. From a certain secret angle, his knuckles formed a protruding something, probably unintended by the sculptor. At 18 or 19, it was considered a special sign of cultural subversiveness to point this protrusion out to a girl on a date and elicit a sexy giggle. I couldn't shake this association, even as my father and I joined a group of eight or 10 refuseniks already lined up in front of the Timidazov monument. I had met two or three of them before. My father knew almost all of these men and women grown middle-aged or even old during the refusenik years. Clipped or sewn to the breasts of several protesters were small posters with slogans. Having survived among my parents' papers in a she is a sheet of white paper with a number of such slogans written out. That's the picture I showed you before. Written out, crossed out, or edited. Freedom of emigration to all refuseniks, people of all faiths fight for the freedom of Jews, refuseniks, Auschwitz, Babi Yar, and refuseniks, a Jewish tragedy, and others. Which one was my father to wear on his black leather coat with a row of buttons? I don't remember. The memories begin to falter and spin out of control. We arrive beneath the botanist's feet and greet the other refuseniks. Young men, some of them dressed in sporty attire, jump out of the buses parked right nearby. From another bus, slowly descends a group of old men in derby hats, military decorations and badges are pinned to their chests. Several uniformed cops stand on either side of the low wrought iron fence separating the inner pedestrian space of the boulevard from the street and late morning traffic. The young men have short hair and broad shoulders. Their mouths are twisted with ferocity. They're moving closer to our small chain of refuseniks. The war veterans shuffle their feet behind the broad backs of the jocks. Maybe a reporter or two are flashing cameras from a distance, but otherwise we are alone. Uniformed police are not interfering, just standing there and barking into their walkie-talkies. The jocks come up to the refusing protesters and methodically rip off their small posters. The refuseniks continue to stand in place, some of them turning their heads to the side as if offering the other cheek to their detractors. Why are these Jewish men and women passive, I wonder? Are they prepared to face annihilation with silent determination? Father and I are standing on the leftmost flank of the demonstration. Everything is unraveling so quickly that father hasn't even attached his poster when two thugs have stepped forward to rip one off the raincoat of a refusenik woman right next to us. What are you doing? I yell at the two athletes. I cannot control myself. What do you want, sissy? You stay out, out of it. One of them replies, stepping toward me. Face to face, I get a good look at my enemy. He is not a bored young man from a working class suburb, seduced with ultra patriotic hogwash. This one is a professional, a well-groomed man in his late 20s with a clean shave. His athletic cap and jacket must be a costume. He was issued at his office that morning to look like a Soviet nobody, but a thug, he is all the same, doubly the thug, because he takes a salary and state benefits for persecuting defenseless refuseniks. 
What right do you have to do this? I scream right in his face. And in place of this one thug, I suddenly see brigades of other thugs as they call Jewish kids kike in the school courtyard, assault Jewish girls in secluded park alleys, knock Jewish mothers off their feet on the Arbat street. What right? The thug now brings his barrel chest inches away from mine. I can smell his cologne sweat, see a faint scar beneath his right eye. Yes, what right? I scream back. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. These people have a constitutional right to free speech, I scream. Get him out of here! A war veteran bleat, a war veteran's bleaty voice emerges from behind the thug's back. Why isn't he paying his debt to the motherland? In my state of extreme agitation, I can still process the fact that the old goat is referring to me and to military service. I know I should stop and retreat, but I cannot. I want to fight the thug. I want to rip his throat out. I feel as though years of bottled up rage are about to burst out of me. I want revenge for what he had done to my mother just a few weeks ago. I can feel that our bodies are about to collide, that he's just waiting for me to shove him first. Fortunately, my father brings his right arm around my chest and restrains me. Stop. He is provoking you, father whispers loudly as he drags me away from the thug who still hasn't moved. Only after a few minutes of being pulled away from the scene and in the direction of the Pushkin Monument do I begin to come out of the trance. I was lucky, very lucky. I had escaped unscathed. My father didn't say anything to me afterwards. I think he wanted but held back. Only now, as a father, of two teenage children, a man in my 50s, have I begun to understand what my father was feeling. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maxime, uh, for reading to us uh, these uh, very powerful passages. And now we have uh, 20 minutes for questions. Um, I understand that questions will be sent to me through uh, the Zoom chat. So, of course, I have many questions, and <laughs> but uh, I would uh, allow the audience to start asking first. But while the, while the audience are <clears throat> gathering their feet and uh, sending in questions, we can make a start as panelists, or Vera, you could make a start as a or Sander also has a question. Yes, Sander, please go ahead. First of all, Maxim, thank you. I mean, one of the things that always impresses me <clears throat> is that I, I read your memoir, but of course, hearing you read it is a completely different experience. And I'm very grateful for that. Thank you, Sander. Uh, I want to ask about Gorbachev and the Gorbachev moment that you have at the last bit of the moment of the reading. Because again, the, and I, I, this is my hobby horse and I apologize for this. Um, these categories for me are always malleable. What can one imagine, hypothetically, can one imagine something having happened at that moment which would have persuaded any of the refuseniks to stay in the Soviet Union, in Russia, and what becomes Russia. In other words, the refuseniks strike me as a complicated group of people who have multiple motivations. They're very different than the great emigration that happens afterwards, which is partially political, but partially economic, right? It is partially economic. What was it, would it have been conceivable for any of the refuseniks to have said, we have a new world, we have Glasnost, um, we want to stay and build a new state in Russia? No, it's a very, very interesting question and one I have given some thought to and have had many conversations with veteran refuseniks of my parents' generation. 
about. So let me start from what I know and then quickly, uh, quickly um, sort of uh, add a little bit of uh, speculation. What I know is uh, that um, in the late winter and early spring of 1987, just as uh, the destinies of uh, refuseniks and uh, the destinies of uh, the Soviet Jews were being obviously uh, discussed and considered in the context of uh, Soviet Western relations. There were refusenik individuals, uh, particularly those who belonged broadly to the Tarbutnik sort of uh, side of the refuseniks, those who had more cultural ambitions than political, uh, entertained the possibility of either staying or staying temporarily, as uh, people used to say it, to build Jewish culture at home. To the best of my knowledge, what I know um, anecdotally, but I think I have a fair a uh, fairly accurate picture of that. Those were still minority voices. In the book, I have an episode which I describe in general. I just wanna, I want you uh, to understand that the whole literary eyewitnessing principle in the book is I do not write about things I did not see. And which is why I really, really struggle in the episode of my mother's be, uh, participation in the Begun demonstration because I was not there. Uh, that's one of the few moments I reconstruct. But I witnessed, for instance, a remarkable conversation between the late Yuri Kosharovsky, Yuri Kosharovsky, one of the leaders of very top echelon of Vyfusnik activists, and my father. Kosharovsky came to see my father and asked if he would be interested essentially in staying and taking charge of a Jewish cultural initiative at home with some funding from uh, the West and from Israel. And uh, my father said, absolutely not, under no circumstances. So of course, Sander, there is truth to some of these uh, trepidations. Uh, now, um, I think if you wanna find a document where this is really thrown into relief, in the spring of 1987, uh, some of you may re uh, probably recall this. This is when CBS News used to do these hour-long specials. Dan Ra Rather travels to the Soviet Union with a team of top reporters, including Diane Sawyer, and they do a documentary about Russia on the verge of reforms. And what they do is they identify, well, they had originally, they had researchers uh, who were doing it first. Uh, they identify various... Uh, sort of emblematic or interesting figures from all walks of life. I mean, it had Yeltsin, it had uh, Soviet military, naval uh, command, it had uh, doctors, it had drug users, but it had two refuseniks. Uh, one of them was Vladimir Felsman, the pianist. The other was my father. And on screen in the interview, Dan Rather asked him specifically, would you ever consider staying? And uh, this was in English and my father was very nervous and my mother was translating. And I remember my father said, Ab absolutely no, under no circumstances. And to me, this really captures the mood of the veteran refuseniks, that basically they acknowledged that the country was probably beginning to change, but uh, it was really no longer their country or our country. And I really appreciate the question, Sander, because I think this again paints the divide between refusenik activists and dissidents, both Jewish and non-Jewish. Thank you very much, uh, Maxim. We have a question from the audience, and this is, um, um, Maxim, whether you could comment on how you understand the relationship between uh, the refuseniks and other dissident um, movements uh, among minorities in the Soviet Union, for, uh, for instance, Ukrainians, Crimean Tatars, and the Bolts. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. And I am sure I will not be able to uh, do it justice uh, because of the time we have. Uh, I deal with it to some extent in the book because uh, as a young man, I was very interested and still am. I probably should have become an anthropologist uh, in the whole ethnic plethora of the Soviet Union. When I was at Moscow University, I for the first time experienced the true ethnic diversity of the country. And also as a young man, I got to travel in the south of Russia, in the foothills 
of the Caucasus where there are a lot of small ethnic minorities, sometimes villages which have 3,000 people with a language of their own and a strong cultural identity. So this is something I'm very sensitive to. I think, uh, I think refusing activists and uh, some of the activists that uh, were mentioned in the question, particularly the Crimean Tatars, uh, the Volga Germans, uh, most of whom at the time were living in Kazakhstan, and uh, to some degree Estonians, uh, um, um, of course, found common ground. But at the same time, it's important to acknowledge the obvious, which is that these were groups with a territorial stronghold, either where they were living or from which they were exiled. Jewish refuseniks essentially were in a very different position vis-a-vis -vis Soviet history and Stalin's crimes uh, and Stalin's deportations and collective punishment of the nations. I'll add one interesting footnote because I don't think this is well known. And uh, uh, this is something incidentally that uh, my father in his uh, novel, Dr. Levitin, which is available in English, treats in some detail, which is where the common interests of uh, Jewish activists and Volga German activists became absolutely apparent were the lines outside the visa offices, where side by side, the Volga Germans, who at that time were for all intents and purposes, absolutely Russianized and uh, Jewish refuseniks stood. And uh, really uh, there was, there was a uh, visceral solidarity uh, because at that time, the Volga Germans, of course, were beginning to advocate for being released and allowed to emigrate to Germany. And this I find very, very interesting. We felt solidarity for each other. And we were in the same lines, petitioning and protesting. And I'm sorry that there's a lot more to this question, but let me stop here. And by the way, you know, which is why I find so interesting now to travel in Germany, because you see, uh, you know, the former Volga Germans and their children. I mean, I, every time I, I go with my family, I say, look, I'll make a bet, this young man, here is a uh, descendant of the Volga Germans. I can hear it in his Russian cadence and it's usually the case. Thank you. We have a question raised hand um, from Armella. No? No, I didn't want to ask a question. No, I no, sorry. I was, no, you have to. You absolutely have to. I saw the raised hand. Um, sorry. Um, if there aren't uh, any... Uh, uh, um, Kathy? Yes. Um, I would, I'd be interested. Uh, first of all, Maxime, thank you very much uh, for your reading. It was really, really amazing. And, and again, also very, very moving. Um, and your detailed descriptions of, you know, the demonstrations and how that felt. Um, I was wondering if you <clears throat> had connections with um, maybe let's call them Jews who dissented elsewhere in the Eastern Bloc or whether the connections were mainly uh, to the, the West, you know, to the United States, for example, I think there were definitely connections there, but were there connections or intellectual networks or exchanges um, with Jews elsewhere in the Eastern Bloc? It's a very interesting question, and I wish I could tell you something of the sort that you'd like to hear. I uh, had no firsthand awareness of any such connections, perhaps with the exception of some descendants of Polish Jews who ended up in the Soviet Union after uh, 1939, who ended up, as you know, on the Soviet-occupied eastern part of Poland and then stayed uh, in Central Asia. We had friends from those families and one particular person I'll mention because it was an important, important person in my formation is the late Yusuf Kohn, very important uh, Russian Jewish musicologist. His method of uh, structural analysis of music is now increasingly recognized as a very important one, who lost his entire family in Poland, who was at ended up in Tashkent, was teaching at the conservatory there. And then basically he ended up living in a, and teaching at a branch of the Leningrad Conservatory of Music. The point is in the 1970s, 
he had reconnected of some distant relatives in Poland and began to travel to Poland. There were such uh, uh, Polish Jews, Sovietized Polish Jews. And of course he brought back stories. Probably that was the extent. Otherwise, I can tell you this, my father, when he was still a member of the Writers Union, was very involved in literary translation, particularly from the languages of the former Yugoslavia and from Lithuanian, and had many connections uh, with poets. Uh, uh, as soon as we became refuseniks, uh, all the connections were severed, I mean, completely and totally. So there was, and I hate to say it, but let the truth be told, there was zero, a big fat zero of solidarity even though some of these people, particularly from the former Yugoslavia, had very little to lose. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, only, the only person I remember who displayed open solidarity was the Estonian poet Mats Trot, wonderful person and wonderful poet who came to see us in Moscow. And I remember he used to call my father King David uh, and he was unafraid. Uh, but that was really one of the few exceptions, which is why the point for me is uh, uh, one of large silence and very few people who actually displayed solidarity. Um, I'm wondering though, I mean, I, I wouldn't know about, you know, all the East Bloc countries. And I mean, that's part of what we're, what we're doing in this conference is also to, to uncover, uh, you know, these stories and to, to, to even go searching for them, whether they exist and to uncover them. Right. Right. So, but, um, uh, I know from an East German uh, perspective that it, it wasn't easy to even travel to the Soviet Union and you needed a permission. And I still uh, need a visa. <laughs> uh, if I may share this anecdotally, um, when I was a child, my parents uh, took me on a visit to the, not a child, a young person, a young, a, te a teenager. My parents took me on a, a visit to Moscow. Um, and, and you could only go if you knew somebody there who invited you or if you went with an official tourist group. So we went with an official tourist group. Um, and so we were, sh we were kind of shuffled around to different places and we were always nannied by the, the, tour, the, the Soviet tour guide. And on the last day, we were taken to a restaurant on the outskirts of Moscow. Uh, and everybody ate and was very merry. And me being a teenager and not really so aware of all of this, or only vaguely aware of this, I just did what I always did, which was, you know, I just took myself off at some point and went for a walk in the neighborhood, which was uh, astonishing because we were in a satellite district of Moscow, it seemed, with, with, with kind of the usual socialist, you know, high rises. But there were also wooden huts uh, which I'd never seen in my life before and which had, you know, people sitting outside um, and so, yeah, I mean, all of that was, was very astonishing to me. When after half an hour, I returned to the restaurant, the, the tour guide was beyond herself, besides herself. I mean, she may have lost her job after this, you know? I mean, she had lost a member of the group whom she was supposed to, uh, you know, nanny and make sure precisely that I wasn't going off and seeing things and talking to people uh, and, you know, in, in ways that, that weren't authorized. So um, I just, I just, I'm just wondering, you know, it wasn't actually so easy to find out uh, about these things. And, and, and certainly, um, I mean, we were still young, but in my circles, we knew about the refuseniks from hearsay, but we certainly, you know, didn't didn't know anybody personally and wouldn't have known even how to how to make these connections. Right, but you were living in the former uh, GDR, correct? Yeah. Right. No, this makes total sense because, of course, there was tremendous awareness by the late 1970s in uh, Western Europe and in North America, and of course in Israel. Oh, in Eastern Bloc countries, I am sure the awareness was very limited. Uh, oddly enough. I believe this is not a question. I'm not aware of any specific scholarship on this uh, topic, but I, you, what you said, Kathy, reminded me of one small thing. The war, of course, students from the Eastern Bloc countries, also, also from what is, was at the time called third world countries, African and uh, South American countries with the Soviet Union, which the Soviet Union tried to patronize, we, who s attended universities in Russia. And uh, there was some, there was some 
you know, uh, commerce, some chemistry between ordinary Soviet students and, and those. So I did interact, now that you've mentioned, with students from the former uh, GDR, from Bulgaria. And uh, I think I did feel a certain sense of solidarity uh, and uh, perhaps greater than from some of my Soviet classmates. Just thank you for bringing this up. I actually completely forgot about it. Maxine, did you ever go to a World Peace Conference, a World Youth Conference? No. <laughs> Susan have a question, has a question. Uh, well, I have many. I mean, it was a fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Actually, I just, since we mentioned Viktor Orban and stuff uh, earlier, I this is purely on the anecdotal level for which I, I asked your, your uh, kind of, uh, forgiveness, but I know a couple of, you know, uh, 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 Russian uh, refuseniks or people who had trouble uh, leaving and finally did leave in 1987, um, who are the generation of your parents, uh, Maxine. And uh, to my great surprise, they are both, um, they love, they pretty much love and admire Vladimir Putin. Uh, and uh, are also Trump voters. And I just wonder, how do you sort of square their experience in Soviet Russia, you know, with uh, their current uh, political, uh, first of all, am I, are these people totally uh, exceptional and I just happen to know them? Or uh, in your experience, uh, are there others uh, would you be able to make any general statements, I mean, uh, about the, the population of former refuseniks who, uh, that current politics, which, which strikes me as, as in some ways astonishing. Can I, Susan, thank you very much for your question. It's actually something very similar I wanted to ask. So I'll kind of reformulate, maybe sort of add and Maxime, you can take both of our questions together. I didn't want to start with my question because I thought it would be too, too provocative. Um, uh, in fact, just very briefly, Maxime and I kind of share um, probably a lot of common friends because um, my husband, my ex-husband was uh, a kind of uh, less known dissident and Jewish as well. And, um, uh, we were expelled from the Soviet Union in 1981, so we're actually very lucky to get out uh, because of his very close relationship with um, Elena Bonner, uh, Sakharov's wife, um, and the KGB for some reason thinking that my ex-husband was even her um, nephew, and they wanted to isolate Sakharov at the time, so we were um, expelled. Uh, and I obviously had a particular view uh, of uh, refuseniks and Jewish immigration, which is kind of in a way very similar. You are showing uh, us in your um, uh, wonderful uh, memoir. Uh, but then I, uh, sorry, to, it, it just relates to my question. So uh, I briefly summarize. Then I remarried and married another Jewish person um, who was, English Jewish and whose family uh, uncles moved to Israel in the 1950s and both became very liberal uh, but not particularly left-wing academics uh, in Israel. Uh, and uh, one of the uncles, because he was a specialist on Soviet nationalities relations in particular at Tel Aviv University, uh, was very involved in helping refuseniks and uh, sort of Soviet Jews to immigrate to Israel. And their view now of the Jewish emigration in Israel is very similar to what Susan uh, described uh, in relation to the United States. So there, this uh, Israel, uh, this uh, basically the people who built, they felt the state of Israel uh, starting from the what late 40s, 1950s, uh, feel that uh, the influx of Soviet Jews lurched uh, Israel to the extreme right and basically undermined the democratic foundations of the state. Uh, and it's very difficult for me to kind of accept and hear those narratives 
but I think they have to be confronted. And in order for us to understand any dissident movement, we should kind of reflect on how a dissident movement in some ways unwittingly uh, mirrors the system it opposes. So sorry for speaking so long. So that's kind of... Thank you. These are very interesting reflections and uh, I truly don't think I'm prepared to reflect on them because I think they already make all the points that uh, were necessary to make. Uh, the, for reasons, uh, Susan, you may know this uh, from the late Svetlana Boim, I, I do a lot of work on Vladimir Nabokov and uh, your question and also very, uh, your, uh, very, your comment as well, brought to mind a very strange comment that Vera Nabokov, uh, Vladimir Nabokov's wife, who was Jewish, came from a very, very uh, educated, Europeanized, uh, privileged Russian family in St. Petersburg, but never converted and was very strongly Jewish in spirit. Once uh, made about reading Saul Bellow, which is, she said, I have met a lot of Jews, but I have never met the kinds of Jews that Saul Bellow describes. And I find it a very peculiar comment, but also very telling. So in answer to your question, I have, uh, I have yet to meet a former refusenik who is a Putin an apologist. Uh, however, however, I've met many former refuseniks who vote uh, who vote Republican and have been Trump supporters. Uh, so I don't really see a contradiction. And so let me leave it at that. Uh, uh, obviously, obviously, my family is uh, not in that group, but uh, mm -hmm. the point is, uh, I don't think there is uh, any contradiction in the in the predictors of uh, voting outcome on the part of the former of the former subjects of the Eastern Bloc. I think on mass they tend to vote more conservative in Western democracies. Uh, to me, there is no contradiction. Uh, their Jewishness is a complicating factor, but I don't think it's the Jewishness that determines how they vote. And as far as Israel is concerned, look, one fourth of Israel now of Israeli Jews are Russian speaking. How else could it be? The Jewish immigration has changed the texture of everyday life in Israel. Uh, it's changed the texture of everyday life in some of American and Canadian cities, but not to such a degree. And uh, so I don't know why people are so surprised that there is uh, a shift in Israel. To me, this only proves the very point that we are belaboring. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Maxim. Uh, I think uh, we um, kind of used up all our time and of course we could have spoken for hours um, in relation to the very important questions uh, you raised. But uh, now I would like to thank you very much and uh, also the audience for asking very good questions. Thank you so much. Okay.